Shout out to Tyler, everybody. We thank you and we greet you to Hebrew Readers Church. We thank you on this wonderful Shabbat day that Ahaya has given unto us. Today, our lesson is going to be the lust of the eyes. And uh, this is a, a very important topic, seeing as we're going into the end days and everything is about fulfillment of lust. And even from the beginning, the lust that was sprinkled on the fruit at the beginning of the world. So we definitely hope that you all enjoy this lesson and that it's very edifying and it, it builds you in righteousness and it allows you to stay away from the snares of the devil and the, and the stumbling blocks that he places before us. So, Katha? In the beginning, according to the prophets of Moses, the woman, Eve, the mother of us all, the devil had seduced her through subtlety of words and taken her away from the simplicity that's in Christ to give in to the lust of the eye. When you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, For Allah doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as Allah knowing good and evil. Now this is key. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband and he did eat. So we can see how the eyes was a place that we needed to take heed of from the beginning. And there was something that the devil did that's not mentioned in Genesis that has caused us all to have this battle that we have within us today to overcome the lust. In the Apocalypse of Moses, chapter 19, verse 3, this is Chihuahua giving an account of what happened when Satan tempted her. And I opened to him, and he walked a little way, and then turned and said to me, I have changed my mind, and will not give thee to eat until thou swear to me to give also to thy husband. And I said, What sort of oath shall I swear to thee? Yet what I know, I say to thee, by the throne of the master and by the cherubim and the tree of life, I will give also to my husband to eat. And when he had received the oath from me, he went and poured upon the fruit the poison of his wickedness, which is lust, the root and beginning of every sin. And he bent the branch to, on the earth, and I took of the fruit, and I ate. So we see... As Brother Zappa mentioned, overcoming this loss has been key for us from the beginning. And this is the situation the world is in. Brother Zappa, can you read First John chapter 2, verse 16 and 17? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Because we see from the beginning who brought lust into the world. And that's why it's not of the Father. Continue, please. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of Allah abideth forever. Now we can see what separates us from the lust. Whether it be lust of the flesh, which we've been talking about, you know, 12 evil women and things of that nature, and the lust of the eye, we can be separated from it by doing the will of the Father. So we see how the devil, through his temptations, he causes us to desire after what is not good for us. As opposed to when we work in Yahweh by faith, he leads us to us pleasing in the sight of Allah. Hence you have the shepherd of Hermas talks about cleaving to the good desire and staying away from the evil desire in Mandate 12 that you can also visit for exhortation on the gospel. Now, we also have exhortation from Reuben on understanding how our eyes play a major role in our battle to overcome lust. Can you read that, please? Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, and then chapter 3, verse 2 to 3, please. Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verse 1. And now hear me, my children, what things I saw concerning the seven spirits of deceit when I repented. Seven spirits, therefore, are appointed against man, and they are the leaders in the works of youth. 
and seven other spirits are given to them at his creation, that through them should be done every work of man. The first is the spirit of life, with which the constitution of man is created. The second is the sense of sight, with which ariseth desire. Our eyes are with us. We've been given these things to do our works, and also it can be used against us through the spirits of deceit. And we see that sight is which arises desire. All right, continue to chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, please. With these spirits are mingled the spirits of error. First, the spirit of fornication is seated in the nature and in the senses. It's the spirit of fornication in our senses that causes that desire to arise from our eyes. Hence, we have to work through the mental process of changing our mind's eye view with everything we see, knowing that the spirit of fornication is working against us to look at things with a view to desire, but knowing that Christ commands for us to have our eyes be light so that our whole body may be light, we have to work through the mental process of changing our thoughts and our perspectives so that when we look at things, we look at them according to light rather than according to fornication wherewith arises desire. Reuben understanding these things admonished us on overcoming fornication in the mind, reminding us of Joseph in Reuben chapter 4, verse 8 and 11. And he said, For ye have heard regarding Joseph, how he guarded himself from a woman, and purged his thoughts from all fornication, and found favor in the sight of Allah higher man men. Jumping to verse 11, where he says, For if fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can Belier overcome you. So he understood the mental aspect of fornication working in the senses to know that we have to change our minds to be able to overcome its attacks, to see things with the right mindset so that regardless of what we look at, we see them in truth with a good mind toward it and won't be affected by the evil thoughts. Let's look at the admonitions for us to overcome this spirit of lust in the eyes in Ecclesiasticus chapter 9 verse 2 to 9 please because we see how doing the will of Allah separates us from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes therefore these admonitions give us guidance on how to overcome the lust of the eyes give not thy soul unto a woman that set her foot upon thy substance meet not with an harlot lest thou fall into her snares Use not much of the company of a woman that is a singer, lest thou be taken with her attempts. Gaze not on a maid, that thou fall not by those things that are precious in her. Give not thy soul unto harlots, that thou lose not thine inheritance. Look not round about thee in the streets of the city, neither wander thou in the solitary place thereof. Turn away thine eye from a beautiful woman. And look not upon another's beauty, for many have been deceived by the beauty of a woman. For herewith love is kindled as a fire. That struggle with the wanton eye to fulfill the pleasure of being enamored with the beauty of women is by fornication working in the senses. And then gazing upon the women, it inspires infatuation and is kindled as a fire. The evil inclination of mind with the struggle with the spirit of fornication working in the senses can also inspire the burning lust. We have an example of that. People being burned in their lust, the men of Sodom with the vile affections. And then you also have Amnon, a man of the tribe of Judah. And Judah admonished his children not to gaze upon the beauty of women. And you can see in Amnon's case, the beauty of his sister gazing upon her cause him to fall into a burning lust for her being vexed with an evil spirit because he had fallen in love with his sister so you can see how these evil spirits can attack in different ways hence we have to be on guard with our eyes not to gaze upon the beauty of women nor pay heed to the face of a woman or pay heed to the beauty of women nor to be enamored with the beauty of women walking in singleness of soul like reuben talked about just like in scripture, when if somebody was beautiful, they'll say she was comely or beauteous to behold and leave it right there. Therefore, the same way we speak in truth in our heart, if someone's attractive, okay, the person's attractive. Leave it right there and don't sit entertaining the thought so that we won't be enamored with it. Nor give in to gazing upon the person or 
trying to look back for a second look to lust after her. All right, continue, please. Sit not at all with another man's wife, nor sit down with her in thine arms, and spend not thy money with her at the wine. Leave thy heart inclined unto her, and so through thy desire thou fall into destruction. And we have these admonitions to avoid being in situations that will promote the spirit of fornication. And this is for good reason, like don't sit with another man's wife, because for one, Reuben testified that women are overcome with the spirit of fornication more than men. So we have to be on guard so as not to set a stumbling block before their sisters. And notice it said, lest thine heart incline unto her, and so through thy desire thou fall into destruction. So one has to be on guard for oneself as well, because it could be one's own desire that's leading one to get in a situation that would promote lust and fornication. Um, can you continue to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24 to 29, please? To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her, shall not be innocent. One of the helps that will deliver us from the lust of the eye is shamefacedness. We've heard earlier that doing the will of Allah delivers us. Also, being shamefaced for righteousness delivers us. If we can read the book of Sirach, chapter 41, verse 16 and 17, and verse 20 to 22, please. Therefore be shamefaced according to my word, for it is not good to retain all shamefacedness. Neither is it altogether approved in everything. Be ashamed of whoredom before father and mother, and of a lie before a prince and a mighty man, and of silence before them that salute thee, and to look upon an harlot, and to turn away thy face from thy kinsmen, or to take away a portion or a gift, or to gaze upon another man's wife, or to be over busy with his maid, and come not near her bed, or of upbraiding speeches before friends, and after thou hast given, upbraid not. That shamefacedness comes from the spirit of humility. Can you read the Testament of Gad, chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, please? But he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust. Being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because a higher looketh on his inclination. I want to understand that the overcoming of the lust to truly be shamefaced and walk in humility is when one is ashamed to do that which is evil, being reproved of one's own heart is because you actually desire to do it. Because one can't make another person change. A person has to want to change for themselves. They have to see it and come to the place where they don't want to do it anymore, where that lust is being taken away, their desires unto the good desire to do the will of Allah. Hence, from their heart, they're going to be accusing or excusing themselves from the heart, not worried about what another may say or another's rebuke, but what's right from their own heart because they are seeking to serve Yahweh from the heart. The best thing we as believers can do is set the example to give them hope that through Yache, change is possible by seeing the change in us. So that's important to overcoming the lust of the eye as well, being renewed after the inner man in sincerity. Now there's also some things that we ought not to be ashamed of as well. Ecclesiasticus chapter 42, verse 1 and 2 and verse 12, please. So Rock chapter 42, verse 1. Of these things be not thou ashamed, and accept no person to sin thereby. Of the law of the Most High, and his covenant, and of judgment to justify the unholy. 
verse 12. Behold, not everybody's beauty and sit not in the midst of women. That admonition is being continually admonished to us. Don't look upon everyone's beauty and do not sit in the midst of women. And it's important for us to keep these admonitions so that we can be delivered from lust of the eye. And let's look at what our Lord Yache said in Matthew 5, verse 27 and 28, please. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. It's important because he said, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her. This is tying into understanding the mind. Because it's not a sin to see a woman in general, but the intent or reason of looking upon a woman is where the issue lies. We have to come to a place of simplicity in the mind. Because we're in the world, we're going to see people interact with people. We have to work through the growth process of compassion and simplicity of mind to see people as brothers and sisters. We see each other as our fellow human being. Rather than an object of desire. Not giving heed to any inclination of lust or any lustful thought to cause us to sin thereby. Because the sin is to lust after her. You have, for example, in the Acts of Thomas, there was a woman and her daughter being afflicted by a demon. And the demon will cause the woman and her daughter to, to strip themselves wherever they were. And when Thomas seen them, he was grieved for them. He didn't have a lustful inclination toward what he saw, but he was looking according to the Spirit, seeing sadly what was happening to his own sisters in the faith of Yahweh. Thankfully, Yahweh had delivered them as well. So hope that helps understand overcoming the lust of the eyes and the mind, mm -hmm. to have a simple mind towards all. You also have a good example of the other dichotomy with the shepherd of Hermes and Hermes helping the woman who was bathing. She was like a sister to him, but then the thought of lust entered into his heart and uh, he was reproved for it. So uh, if you want to see how to overcome such a thing, the shepherd of Hermes is a good book to go into. Thank you. I thought that was really good that you brought that up. You can find this book on the website as well. Shepherd of Hermes, Vision 2, starting at verse 2 through 8. After a certain time, I saw her bathing in the river Tiber, and I gave her my hand and led her out of the river. So seeing her beauty, I reasoned in my heart, saying, Happy were I if I had such an one to wife, both in beauty and in character. I merely reflected on this and nothing more. And after a certain time, as I was journeying to Kume and glorifying Allahim's creature for their greatness and splendor and power, as, as I walked, I fell asleep and the, a spirit took me and bore me away through a pathless tract through which no man could pass. For the place was precipitous and broken into clefts by reason of the waters. When then I had crossed the river, I came to the level country and knelt down and began to pray to Ahaya and to confess my sins. Now while I prayed, the heaven was opened, and I see the lady whom I had desired greeting me from heaven, saying, Good morrow, Hermas. And I looked at her, and I said to her, Lady, what doest thou here? Then she answered me, I was taken up that I might convict thee of thy sins before Ahaya. I said to her, Dost thou now convict me? Nay, not so, said she, but hear the words that I shall say to thee. Allahim who dwelleth in the heaven and created out of nothing the things which are and increased and multiplied them for his holy church's sake is wroth with thee, for thou didst sin against me. I answered and said, Sin against thee? In what way? Did I ever speak an unseemly word unto thee? Did I not always regard thee as a female deity? Did I not always respect thee as a sister? How couldest thou falsely charge me, lady, with such villainy and uncleanness? Laughing, she saith unto me, The desire after evil enter into thine heart. Nay, thinkest thou not that it is an evil deed for a righteous man if the evil desire should enter into his heart? It is indeed a sin and a great one too, she saith, For the righteous man entertaineth righteous purposes. While then his purposes are righteous, his repute stands steadfast in the heavens, and he finds Ahaya easily propitiated in all that he does. 
But they that entertain evil purposes in their hearts bring upon themselves death and captivity, especially they that claim for themselves this present work and boast in his riches and cleave not to the good things that are to come. The thing was is that there's no problem with wanting a wife. The problem was is that Hermes didn't desire her until he seen her stripped without clothes. He tried to cover his lust by saying, wouldn't it be great to have her as a wife when he was actually just fornicating? He was actually just lusting in his heart. And that's what Ahaya had called out to the woman testifying against him, is that he was actually lusting. The lust had entered into his heart. So it wasn't about him. Man, it would be great if I would have such a woman as a wife. Hermes actually was lusting after the woman to sleep with her in truth. So you can see how that lust entered into his heart. He didn't desire the woman to be his wife before he seen her without clothing. So you can see how the iniquity entered into his heart and it led him astray. And we have that admonition to understand how to entertain righteous purposes in all situations according to the admonition. Is there anything else there? It would probably be good to go into Reuben. Reuben chapter 4, verse 1. Pay no heed, therefore, my children, to the beauty of women, nor set your mind on their affairs. But walk in singleness of heart in the fear of Ahaya, and expend your labor on good works, and study, and on your flocks, until Ahaya give you a wife, whom he will, that she suffer not as I did. That's great admonition for the unmarried. Also, there's admonition for those who are already married to help as well. We look at Hermas Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, I charge thee, saith he, to keep purity, and let not the thought enter into thy heart concerning another's wife. So don't think about a man's wife. Or concerning fornication. You should not think about sleeping with an unmarried woman that you don't have an accord with to marry either because that would be fornication. Now as was mentioned, it's not a sin to desire an unmarried woman for a wife as is shown in Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 11 where it says, And seest thou among the captives a beautiful woman and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife? And then verse 13 of Deuteronomy 21 says, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thy house, and shall bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. So you see, having the desire to marry a woman is not a sin in itself, as Zachwan had mentioned. But just looking upon a woman with the thought of lusting after her is a problem. As Yache declared in Matthew 5 and 28 that if you look upon a woman to lust after her, we've committed adultery already in our heart. A pure mind doesn't think like that. When you look at Testament of Benjamin chapter 8 verse 2, it says, He that hath a pure mind in love looketh not after a woman with a view to fornication, for he hath no defilement in his heart, because the spirit of Elohim resteth upon him. So there we see having that righteous inclination and entertaining righteous purposes really comes in handy to have a pure mind. And in that pure mind, we wouldn't look on, upon a woman with a view to fornication, nor for the sake of lusting after her. As I mentioned earlier, if you happen to see a beautiful woman, it's not a sin in itself, nor is acknowledging the fact that a person is comely. So long as one doesn't let that thought go past that, into thinking about them in the wrong way. Just like in the scripture, they'll simply state the fact of a person being comely or goodly to look upon and leave it right there. Benjamin continues to explain how a pure-minded person thinks. For as the sun is not defiled by shining on dung and mire, but rather drieth it both and driveth away the evil smell, so also the pure mind, though encompassed by the defilements of the earth, rather cleanseth them and is not itself defiled. So you can see how entertaining righteous purposes in our minds can help us, even though being encompassed with the defilements of the earth will help us keep our mind pure. Continuing in the Shepherd of Hermas, Mandate 4, chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. 
I charge thee, saith he, to keep purity, and let not a thought enter into thy heart concerning another's wife, or concerning any such like evil deeds. So, also, don't think about the same kind relations or near kin relations as listed in Leviticus chapter 18 either. Continuing and reading the scripture. For in so doing thou committest a great sin, but remember thine own wife always, and thou shalt never go wrong. For shouldest this desire enter into thine heart, thou wilt go wrong. And should any other as evil as this, thou committest sin. For this desire in the servant of Allah is a great sin. And if any man doeth this evil deed, he worketh out death for himself. Look to it therefore. Abstain from this evil desire. For where holiness dwelleth, there lawlessness ought not to enter into the heart of a righteous man. So in our growth process of entertaining righteous thoughts, having the right inclination, and changing our perspective, we have to work to where we see people in truth, not with a view to lust. The Lord is working this process out within us to give us the pure eye to see things straightly. In 2 Clement chapter 12, verse 2 to 6, it explains, For the Lord himself, being asked by a certain person when his kingdom will come, said, When the two shall be one, and the outside as the inside, and the male with the female, neither male or female. Now the two are one, when we speak truth among ourselves. And in two bodies there shall be one soul without dissimulation. And by the outside as the inside he meaneth this. By the inside he meaneth the soul, and by the outside the body. Therefore, in like manner, as thy body appeareth, so also let thy soul be manifest by its good works. And by the male with the female, neither male nor female, he meaneth this. Now the brother seeing a sister should have no thought of her as a female, and that a sister seeing a brother should not have any thought of him as a male. These things, if ye do, saith he, the kingdom of my father shall come. Yache explained to us that the kingdom of Allah is within us. So as we work out our salvation and change in our mindset to see each other as fellow images of our Lord, in simplicity, it will bring the kingdom of Allah With this exhortation from Clement and the exhortations on shamefacedness and admonitions from Reuben, we have great understanding to help us overcome the lust of the eye. Now, touching back to Reuben. The understanding of being aware of lust or being mindful of it and standing aloof from the lust of the eye was a principle that was taught. It was a commandment that was given understanding to God our eyes from the days of old. Even Abraham admonished all his children concerning these things. Let's look at uh, Jubilees chapter 20, verse 1 to 4 and verse 5 to 7, please. Jubilees chapter 20, verse 1. And in the three and fortieth Jubilee, in the sixth year of the third week, Abraham called Ishmael and his twelve sons, and Isaac and his two sons, and the six sons of Keturah and their sons, and he commanded them that they should observe the way of Ahiah, that they should work righteousness and love each his neighbor, and act on this manner amongst all men, that they should each so walk in regard to them as to do judgment and righteousness on the earth, that they should circumcise their sons according to the covenant which he had made with them, and not deviate to the right hand or to the left of all the path which Ahiah had commanded us, and that we should keep ourselves from all fornication and uncleanness, and renounce from amongst us all fornication and uncleanness. And if any woman or maid commit fornication against you, burn her with fire, and let them not commit fornication with her after their eyes and their heart. And let them not take to themselves wives from the daughters of Canaan, for the seed of Canaan will be rooted out of the land. So we see how Abraham also admonished his children not to be given into fornication, 
and notice he said, commit fornication with her after their eyes and their heart. So the understanding that Yahshua gave in Matthew chapter 5, Abraham understood by grace. Because he admonished his children from old time not to commit fornication with the eyes of the heart. So we can know that it had been of old that we have to do things from within so that we may be clean. If we would clean the inside of the cup, then the outside of the cup may be clean also. And thus making the outside as the inside, just as Clement was exhorting us for the kingdom to come. Uh, can you read verse 5, please, in Jubilees? Continue on. And he told them of the judgment of the giants, and the judgment of the Sodomites, and how they had been judged on account of their wickedness, and had died on account of their fornication and uncleanness, and mutual corruption through fornication. And guard yourself from all fornication and uncleanness, and from all pollution of sin, lest you make our name a curse, and your whole life a hissing, and all your sons to be destroyed by the sword. And ye become a curse like Sodom, and all your remnant as the sons of Gomorrah. See how the world, through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, is setting us up to become a Sodom and Gomorrah. Continue, please, verse 7. I implore you, my sons, love the Elohim of heaven, and cleave ye to all his commandments, and walk not after their idols, and after their uncleanness. Abraham implored us to love the Elohim of heaven and cleave to all his commandments. He was exhorting us to do the greatest commandment. Love Ahaya, thy Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And he understood this was what would save us from the idols and the uncleanness of the world. And understanding these idols, this focus is understanding the inner battle the inner warfare of our hearts and our mind that must be overcome to overcome the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. The idols that Abraham is referring to and the uncleanness is not just literally statues, pictures, graven images, cartoons that are made with CGI and things of that nature. It's also the idols within the spirits. Let's look at uh, Barnabas chapter 16, verse 7, please. I find then that there is a temple. How then shall it be built in the name of Ahiah? Understand ye, before we believed on Elohim, the abode of our heart was corrupt and weak. A temple truly built by hands, for it was full of idolatry and was a house of demons, because we did whatsoever was contrary to Elohim. What was going on within our hearts? There were idols in us. There are demons that were in us. And this helps give a better understanding of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness. It's not just things that are going on without. It's within us that we have to overcome. It's within our hearts that these idols and these demons are operating. And the only way to be delivered from them is through Yache in us, the hope of glory. Because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is only through him, through his name, through cleaving unto him, striving in the will of Allah, not looking back, but continually pressing forward, pressing forward with cheer through this chastening process. Know that every time he shows us another demon, shows us another idol that was working in us, to rejoice in it, to know that he's helping us. He's bringing us further along. Because it's only through him. It's only through him to overcome this spiritual warfare. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. As uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, about verse 3 to 6 talks about, bring every high thing into subjection to the obedience of Christ. That's the striving that we're going after. We're striving to overcome the evil thoughts, to overcome the lustful thoughts, to overcome the lust of the flesh, standing aloof from them, being constant in prayer, praying at the appointed times, fulfilling all righteousness. It all plays a part. And doing it from the heart is the most important thing. 
not to be seen of men or to seem righteous in another's eyes, but just to do what's pleasing unto all I am. Now, this is the calling we're called unto. And in truth, there shall be heresies amongst us, because them which are approved must be made manifest. As 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about, there are going to be those who are weaker in the faith, that struggle more than others in certain areas. And sadly, there are also going to be those who are just doing what they want to do. Nonetheless, there is a proper way that we are supposed to operate in the midst of it all. Can we read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 to 14? But these, as the natural brute beasts, made it to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're going to be sporting themselves with their own deceivings. These are those that come with their own doctrine, their own perspective, their own righteousness, because they're deceiving themselves with their own thoughts, their own perspective, because we're supposed to go according to the law and testimony, because there's one faith. We're supposed to be in that one unity, that one understanding. When we see how we can deceive ourselves through our lust, the devil through envy brought lust into the world. And that lust is what leads us onto false doctrines. And we have to be very mindful of it. Touch on it. Um, it oh, okay, sure. It says, sporting themselves with their own deceiving while they feast with you. Now, we got an example of that with Hermes. When he had seen the woman and he had lusted after her, he made his own deceiving by saying, wouldn't it be great to have such a woman as a wife? Though he was lusting in his heart. So he actually justified his action with a righteous justification, although what he was doing was iniquity. So he was saying, okay, I'm going to justify what I'm doing, my lust, by saying, man, it would be righteous to take care of the wife, which is a wife is righteous. Marriage is righteous. But what Hermes was actually doing in his heart was iniquity because he was lusting. So it's a great example of sporting themselves with their own deceiving. Because Hermes deceived himself just to justify himself. To make him feel he was being upright. Although within his heart there was iniquity. So it says, sporting himself with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So they'll be feasting with you, but they'll be justifying their errors. So that's one of the other things too, where somebody could fall into this iniquity by justifying themselves, justifying their errors. And not truly examining themselves and truly seeing all things as how they are instead of seeing them as how they want them to be. What you presented is important to understand how to overcome that self justification. We can't overcome self justifying without speaking truth in our heart. Can you read verse 14 of uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, please? Example of someone speaking truth in their heart, like David, he committed a sin and when it was brought to his attention, the first thing he said was, I sinned. He didn't seek a means to make it sound right. And you can see on the opposite, and Hermas, he was looking at the lady like, what do you mean? Like, I've always treated you like a sister. You know, what are you talking about? So you can see a difference of being truthful with ourselves. And that's something very important. Because I, I, he desired that we confess, confess our sins and find mercy. That's a, a very important to be truthful in our hearts so that we can overcome the lust within us. Because the justifying, the justifying is the evil spirit giving us a thought to help them stay where they are within us, to help that idol or that demon stay seated in our heart. Now we're all seeking to attain to the perfection of the saints, working out our own spots and blemishes within ourselves. So let's see what could cause us to deceive ourselves to have spots and blemishes, lest we be wise in our conceits and fall into the number of those that Peter are talking about. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. The eyes play into it again. Eyes full of adultery. 
It's interesting because adultery, looking at the lust of the eyes, adultery isn't only lusting after someone else's wife. It's also spiritual fornication to hark into idols because that's one of the seven abominations of mind that devises wicked imaginations according to Proverbs 6, verse uh, 17 and 18, I believe. That eyes of adultery, wow. it also affects how we look at the world, how we look at ourselves, having the lustful eye. And that's why we can't cease from sin because we're always going to go right back to it because we aren't looking at things in truth. It's according to the will of Allah. We're looking at how we can justify ourselves to stay where we are or to be seen in the sight of men, or to not accept what's really going on within. Beguiling unstable soul and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Interesting, he said, they're beguiling unstable souls. Because if one is stable in the faith, and one is looking at things according to the will of Allah, Allah will show what the person really has going on. But if one is as unstable, then one is susceptible to fall to anything because one is not standing on that rock, that foundation of Yache. Right. They have no temperance. Therefore, they, they can't cease from the sin. They fall into every temptation. That's why they're unstable. What's the Greek definition of the word unstable? G793. Unsteadfast. Unfixed. That is, facilitating. Unstable. So you're not steadfast in the faith. First Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Interestingly, the word sober in G3525 means to be calm or collected in spirit, to be temperate, dispassionate, circumspect. That's staying out of our feelings to be objective in all things. With these admonitions, we can see how Yache was giving us what we needed through him and in him to overcome this lust of the eye. And this is a great battleground for us and Luke chapter 11 verse 34 to 36 the light of the body is the eye therefore when thine eye is single that whole body also is full of light but when thy eye is evil thy body also is full of darkness take heed therefore that the light which is in thee be not darkness if thy whole body therefore be full of light having no part dark the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doeth give thee light. Now look at this. We know the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. So that lets us know that if our eyes don't see things according to the commandments and the law, and the fruits of the Spirit that the law brings forth, there's darkness in us that we still need to pray for deliverance from, so that our eyes would be changed to have the right mindset. That's the same thing that Yache said in, uh, in Luke 11 and 35. He said, take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. That's exactly what Paul was talking about when he said, examine thyself. Take heed is to examine. So to examine and make sure that everything that you're doing and everything in your mindset, everything you're thinking is a righteousness and there's no iniquity in you. Every perspective that you see out of, because he's talking about your eyes, every perspective that you see out of, you need to make sure that it's righteous and that you don't have an evil eye. Because a lot of times when people see something, people perceive it differently. But our perception is supposed to be righteous. Our perceptive is supposed to be full of light. And we're not supposed to see things according to darkness and according to iniquity. And that's exactly what lust is. The lust of the eye is your perception on what you see. And that's your mindset of what you see. So what happens is, is when you see something, you perceive it. It goes into your mind and then it goes into your heart. So if you're looking at things and you have an evil eye or your eye is full of darkness, 
everything you see is going to have a sinful perception or a wicked perception which is going to go down into your heart. Now, what we're supposed to be, we're supposed to have a perception full of light. Our eyes are supposed to be full of light. So when we see something, we're supposed to perceive it in righteousness. And righteousness is supposed to enter into our hearts. So this is exactly what Yahche was trying to explain to us. is how to perceive things. How to change your perception. So that your eyes are full of light and your heart is full of light. Praise God. Yeah. This has been a good exhortation for us all. And we had touched on how the men have to be on guard. And also we want to give exhortation for the women as well. In uh, Testament of Reuben, chapter 5, verse 1 to 6 of the verse 5, please. Testament of Reuben, chapter 5, verse 1. But evil are women, my children. And since they have no power or strength over man, they use wild by outward attractions, that they may draw him to themselves. And whom they cannot bewitch, by outward attractions him they overcome by craft. For moreover concerning them, the angel of Ahiah told me and taught me that women are overcome by the spirit of fornication more than men, and in their heart they plot against men. And by means of their adornment they deceive first their minds, and by the glance of the eye instill the poison, and then through the accomplished act they take them captive. For a woman cannot force a man openly, but by a heartless bearing she beguiles him. Flee therefore fornication, my children, and command your wives and your daughters that they adorn not their heads and their faces to deceive the mind. Because every woman who uses these wiles hath been reserved for eternal punishment. For thus they allured the watchers who were before the flood. Now this is important. He said, command your wives and daughters that they adorn not their heads and faces to deceive the mind because every woman who useth these wiles hath been reserved for eternal punishment the key issue is the intent if a woman adorns her head and her face to deceive the mind adorning your head and your face for a righteous purpose like for a day of gladness and or enjoying your time with your husband like Judith you can read her book how she had her garments and all her stuff for the feast days and time with her husband that's righteous there's no punishment for that or being adorned in beautiful garments like Tamar in her multicolored garment that the virgins wore for the daughters of David or are you here in the scriptures Ahia speaks to Jerusalem the church to adorn herself Jewelry even is not a sin in itself because we saw Rebecca, the mother of the children of Israel, and Esau, known as Caucasian, our brother. She was given jewels when she was betrothed to Isaac for a wife. So understand that the jewelry in itself is righteous. You even have also Judith. She had chains, bracelets, rings, and earrings, and all her ornaments, wherein she decked herself in the times with her feast and joy with her husband. A righteous women like herself did not glory in their beauty, though. You have even Esther, for example. She was queen. She had glorious garments. She even had a crown of a high estate, but that's not where her glory in was. She wasn't indulged in it because she wouldn't even wear it when she was in private by herself despising her high estate so you can understand the humility she walked in and she wasn't wearing the stuff with the wrong intent in mind also doing the hair like wearing braids and such is not a sin in itself the issue is focusing on the intent of the heart even putting on makeup that's not a sin you have to be mindful of what is in the makeup to make sure you're not putting some unclean animal products on your skin because we're not supposed to touch these things certain animals or certain creatures defile us by touching them but putting on makeup for example in the scriptures is just described as painting your face to make yourself fair that in itself is no transgression but the intent of why you're doing it is where the fault can be found and you can confirm this to be true in the apocalypse of Peter chapter 7 it tells of the punishment that the women are reserved for for adorning themselves with deception in mind and such things because remember the big issue is to flee fornication sisters you have to be mindful that the intent 
of what you're doing isn't for the sake of fornication. To make it simpler isn't for the sake of trying to get someone to desire you or trying to get someone's attention. It's not your husband to look upon you or to be enamored with you. Judith is a great example of a woman adorning herself with righteous intent because she did it to deliver her people, not for the desire of having people staring at her and seeking their attention. It has to be with good purpose of soul. In the Apocalypse of Peter chapter 7 it says, And again, behold, two women, they hang them by their neck and by their hair. They shall cast them into the pit. These are they which plaited their hair, not to make them beautiful, but to turn them unto fornication. Notice, plaiting your hair to make yourself beautiful isn't a sin, but to turn unto fornication, to do it with the intent of trying to deceive someone using such wiles, it goes on to say, but to turn them unto fornication that they might ensnare the souls of men unto perdition. So if you're doing it with the intent to try to catch a man to get him to do something he shouldn't be doing, there's a punishment for that. And also for the men that give in to it. It goes on to say, And the men that lay with them in fornication shall be hung by their loins in that place of fire, and they shall say one to another, We knew not that we should come unto everlasting punishment. That's what sisters have to be mindful of. Make sure your intents are righteous. Notice seeking to turn a man onto fornication comes with punishment along with laying with a man in fornication. But if a man in the faith of Yache is courting you, spoken to your father, and has the blessing to build with you to see if things can work between you all, and you be agreeable unto it like Rebecca was unto Isaac, and you beautify yourself because you want to look good for the person, that's not a sin because you're not seeking to turn him onto fornication. You're also seeking to be married, which is a righteous thing, to understand the difference. All your inclinations are righteous and everything you're doing is with a good heart and purity. Beautifying yourself for a day of gladness or for in general because you like to upkeep yourself, nothing's wrong with being a cleanly person and staying beautiful. There's nothing wrong with being diligent to ensure you look presentable at all times. That's a righteous thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Just be mindful that your intent for what you're doing isn't to beguile or deceive. And walk in charity, considering the well-being of others. If you're beautiful beyond the beauty of others, like the woman Susanna, consider taking measures to ensure you're not a stumbling block to others like she wore certain garments to ensure that other men wouldn't be enamored with her beauty out of respect unto her husband and being raised in the instruction of the law of Moses by her parents not saying that you have to walk around in a face covering but if you be led by the Lord to dress with more consideration to ensure you maintain modesty that's a righteous thing when we get into the series for the sisters, we'll get more in depth about these things. Hopefully for the time being, we understand the simplicity of knowing that it's the intent of the heart that's the issue when it comes to beautifying oneself. Uh, that was a good precept, Brother Johnny, in the Testament of Joseph. Oh yes, let's read that. Testament of Joseph, chapter 9, verse 5. For when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms and breasts and legs that I might lie with her, for she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned, in order to beguile me, and the Lord guarded me from her devices. You can see the wells of a woman, that's according to the testament of Reuben. Hopefully that helps for the sisters to understand the spirit that's leading to have them bearing their breast out and such as well. On to mind, not only does the woman do it, you remember the images of the Chaldeans on the walls? Yeah, how they were looking so, real heroic. Right, so the, it also happens with the men. Right. And that was uh, from the lesson on graven images and whatnot. Showing how the images of the Chaldeans on the walls, showing them all brave and right. looking real, you know, fierce. It was to tempt the people for fornication and the people were lusting after the men on the walls. So. It happens to the women as well on the other end of it. 
It also gives understanding for men and women to know it's a spirit of fornication that's inspiring people to get online, making videos and take pictures of themselves unclothed or barely any clothes to be seen and to be desired by others. Now, as you mentioned, Reuben, let's pick back up in Testament of Reuben, chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, and then chapter 6, verse 1 to 5, please. Because every woman who useth these wiles hath been reserved for eternal punishment. For thus they allured the watchers who were before the flood. And for as these continually beheld them, they lusted after them. And they conceived the act in their mind. See, fornication is such a strong spirit that even the angels were enamored with the beauty of women and conceived the act of fornication in their mind then that confirms that the battle is in the mind, seeing that it even happened to the angels. And confirms that Reuben's admonitions are true, that fornication attacks the women more than the men, because as we see in the story, the women actually beautified themselves to deceive the mind of the angels. So fornication started working in them first, and they led the angels astray. And then the angels enticed them, as we're about to read. For they changed themselves into the shape of men, and appeared to them when they were with their husbands. And the women lusting in their minds after their forms gave birth to giants. Notice these women were enticed even though they had husbands. So you see how the spirit of fornication is a dangerous spirit. And we all have to be mindful of it in our minds. And sisters hopefully seeing that the angels were deceived by the women first. It helps understand the great humility a woman has to walk in to ensure She's doing all things in uprightness of heart, not with the intent to deceive anyone. Continue, please. For the watchers appeared to them as reaching even unto heaven. Beware, therefore, of fornication. And if you wish to be pure in mind, guard your senses from every woman, and command the women likewise not to associate with men, that they also may be pure in mind. For constant meetings, even though... The unholy deed be not wrought, are to them an irremediable disease, and to us a destruction of Belier and an eternal reproach. For in fornication there is neither understanding nor holiness, and all jealousy dwelleth in the lust thereof. Knowing jealousy dwells in fornication, it's important for us, brothers and sisters, to be content. Because holiness with contentment has great gain. Therefore, if we're not coveting after what somebody else has or somebody else's relationship or something they have going on, but being single of soul, focusing on our own walk and being thankful for the things that we have and the growth that's working in us, the spirit of fornication won't overcome us. Can we read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, please? In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing holiness with good works. This is good exhortation for the women to know to dress in modest apparel because a woman with a good intent wouldn't be showing her breasts and such as we saw the woman doing the case with Joseph. And she would also adorn herself with the fruits of the spirit after the inner man as Peter desired the women to do in first Peter chapter 3 verse 4 because as Paul is saying here the woman would be adorned with shamefacedness and sobriety so the apostles were seeking for the women to put on the fruits of the spirit in their adorning and not be caught up in their outward appearance only of looking beautiful but also making sure you're beautiful from within with the fruits of the Spirit being evident in you. And such things like that is, which is becoming of women professing holiness with good works. So hopefully this helps understand it's not a problem to braid your hair or wear gold or pearls or costly array. You just have to ensure it's actually modest apparel and that you maintain the shamefacedness and sobriety in your heart and that all your endeavors and your intent of the mind are according to women professing holiness and that what you think and the spirits adorned within you are according as peter said is an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit 
which is in the sight of Allah I am of great price that would make you a whole righteous woman not just with the outward look of the beautiful garments and apparel and beautification of yourself so we have ammunition for us both men and women how to overcome this lust to guard all our senses from it to guard our perceptions as I had brother Zakwa exhort us on guard our thoughts men and women in charity we do all things for the edification of others that's why the men as well we dress in a manner where we set not a stumbling block for anyone uh, first Corinthians 13 and 5 please first Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 charity suffereth long and is kind charity envieth not charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up doeth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. It's back to the mindset, what we perceive, because charity thinketh no evil. So we can see how the spirit of charity would encourage us. To adorn ourselves with a good intent of heart, and not with an intent unto fornication or to deceive another. The call away is to make sure we don't set a stumbling block for one another. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 13 to 19, please. Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Doing all things, bearing other people's conscience in mind. And this is the calling that we're called unto. This is the walk in love that we are called unto. And Yache gave these admonitions for good reason because we are in great danger through the spirit of offense, if we cause one of his children to stumble. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 6 to 7, please. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were, on were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. So the offenses must come. Not everyone has the knowledge of Allah to our shame, as Paul admonished in 1 Corinthians 15 and 34. There will be people who struggle to attain unto righteousness. And they will offend the righteous by their deeds. We have to walk in mercy and pray for them and forgive them in hopes that they repent of their ways. Can we read it? Luke chapter 17, verse 1 to 4, please. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, for if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, Forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Let us focus on ourselves overcoming the lust of the eyes and the spirit of fornication, having a change in our perception to see things according to light, walking in a good mind with compassion toward others, as they also are working through their own struggles. Zakwa, can you read Testament of Benjamin, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, please? Testament of Benjamin, chapter 4, verse 1. See ye therefore, my children, the end of the good man. Be followers of his compassion, therefore, with a good mind, that ye also may wear crowns of glory. For the good man hath not a dark eye, for he soweth mercy to all men even though they be sinners, and though they desire with evil intent concerning him, by doing good he overcometh evil. 
being shielded by Allah. The expectation for overcoming the loss of the eye, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. Through faith in the name Yache, the only name of salvation, the holy virgins. If anybody has any questions about the lesson or any other questions, uh, you can write them on the chat. Tabitha Talam, Sister Jules. She always pop up in here somewhere. <laughs> Tabitha Talam. Um, uh, we're going to stay on for a few more minutes to see if anybody else has any questions. Thank you, Brother Michael. Praise Ahaya. You're welcome, Sister Natasha. Ahaya, bless and keep you. If you have any questions that you don't want to put on the chat, please just send us an email at hebrewreaders at gmail.com. We always welcome your questions and comments or any situation or problem or issue that you may be having. Definitely please contact us. All right, everybody, we hope everybody has a peaceful Shabbat and we definitely look forward to hearing from you all soon. We'll be praying for you all. We hope that you all are praying for us. Definitely a higher bless you all. In the name of Yache, Meshiach, and the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKadoshi. Shabbat Shalom.